Hello, everybody. Just giving folks a moment to join the event room. All right, excellent. <clears throat> good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our webinar, Drivers of Agri-Food System Transformation, Lessons from Feed the Future Country Studies. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we begin, I want to orient you to our Zoom event. On the bottom, you'll see most of your controls. Please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button in the toolbar on the left. Please indicate who your question is for, and you can ask questions throughout the event. We'll be having the Q&A session at the end, and we are recording this webinar. We will email you the post-event resources as soon as they're available, and we'll be posting those on the event page over on AgriLinks, as well as on our YouTube channel. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Amy Davies. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Again, my name is Amy Davies and I'm the director of the Feed the Future Office of Policy Analysis and Engagement in USAID's Bureau for Resilience, Environment and Food Security. It's a mouthful. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on the drivers of agri-food system transformation and lessons from Feed the Future Country Studies. I've actually had the opportunity to preview some of this analysis that we'll be discussing today, and I think this session will undoubtedly be extremely valuable for our shared work and our shared mission. We ask a lot of our food systems, including in the work that we're doing through Feed the Future. Food systems need to deliver not just sufficient food, but safe and nutritious and affordable food for healthy diets. We ask them to drive increased economic growth, create more employment opportunities, and rebound from a myriad of shocks and stresses. And we want food systems to deliver on all of this in a way that sustainably protects people as well as planet and advances equality for women and other underserved populations. Obviously, agri-food systems are complex. I myself have Googled food systems numerous times only to find a range of frameworks, graphics, and definitions. So I'm glad in this presentation, we'll start with setting a common understanding for the purpose of this discussion. With multiple entry points and a myriad of challenges and opportunities, it's often difficult to determine how best to invest finite resources in order to achieve the optimal outcomes. It's something we at USAID struggle with and ask ourselves on a regular basis. And while we focus significant resources on investing in innovation in agri-food systems, whether cutting edge research or improved technologies, in USAID, we're also investing in better analytical tools and new methodologies that can help us as practitioners, but most importantly, the governments, businesses, and communities with whom we work to access and utilize data and evidence and to make critical decisions that impact agri-food systems as well as the food security, resilience, and nutrition of populations. But I don't know that we spend as much time, honestly, discussing, debating, and learning from the analysis that we're, that we're doing in order to adjust our path forward and really enhance our collective learning. So that's why I am extremely excited for today's discussion. And I want to express my gratitude not only to you all for participating from wherever you are, but also to our partner, the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, for undertaking and presenting on their recent work in food systems diagnostics. And I encourage all of you to engage in the discussion that follows and ask the hard questions. Again, all of this is really complex. So with that, I'll let us get under a way. So again, welcome. And let me hand over to James Thurlow, the Director of Foresight and Policy Modeling at IFPRI. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Amy. Um, and let me add, add thanks. Um, thanks to everyone for, for um, coming today and for uh, dedicating your time to this, to this discussion. We really appreciate it. 
I should um, start by saying that my colleague Shinshin Diao, who really led all the work that I'm going to present today, unfortunately cannot be with us this morning, and so um, and so I'm representing her work as well as the work of many others, both within IFPRI, within the CGIR, and, and amongst all of our partner institutions. So as Amy said, we're going to be looking at summarizing some of the work that we've been doing, looking at the drivers of agri-food system transformation in a, in a number of low and lower middle income countries, in particular the Feed the Future um, country studies. And um, really, the, the study that we did um, had three objectives. The first is that we wanted to measure, and that's a, that's a big word there, we want to measure countries' agri-food systems. And we want to decompose how they've been changing over the last decade since since 2010. Um, and we want to um, and we want to do that for each of the 21 countries that we're going to focus on. Um, and then we want to step back and draw some identify some patterns, some lessons that we can learn across the countries. So while there's a lot of specificity and details at the country level that are unique to a particular country, is there anything that any patterns that we can see emerging across the Feed the Future countries that might have implications for, um, for our investment portfolios, the advice that we give to governments and the priorities that we set for, the, for agriculture in the broader agri-food system. So this is gonna be a presentation in three parts. The first part is I'm going to start by explaining what I mean by an agri-food system and how I measure it. And I think that's crucially important. As Amy said, there's, there are so many different ways of viewing an agri-food system that I do think it's important to start by saying where, where, where you're coming from, where am I coming from, and how am I thinking about an agri-food system. I'm going to give you some global examples about things we know about agri-food systems, and then I'm going to do in part two, a focused deep dive on the Kenya um, growth diagnostic study, not because Kenya is particularly important or more important than any of the other countries, but because I want to give you a feel for what you can find in these country diagnostic studies. And I'll point you to the link where you can download for particular countries the studies. Um, and then finally, the main part of this presentation is part three, which are the four lessons that we've we've flagged, what we have learned um, from, from doing these case studies. Um, and they're at a very high level, um, uh, but, um, but we'll get to that towards the end. So on the right-hand side is a list of the countries that we have. And I saw we have someone from Honduras, and I'm sure there might be some others from Guatemala. Those are also Feed the Future focused countries, but I'm afraid the data we had wasn't available at the time. So they, they won't be included in this analysis just yet. Um, and there are other countries that I'm, like Liberia and others that we are missing um, just because of, of data constraints. So that's just a, a caveat and acknowledgement from the outset. So let's move to, to part one. Right. What do I mean by an agri-food system? I should start by saying I'm an economist, right? which should already give you concern. I'm an economist. I'm a development economist as well. I'm a macro economist. And so I think of, of agri-food systems very much from that lens. And because I want to measure things, as most economists do, there are some limits on how broad I can, um, I can make the agri-food system that I'm studying. Simply put, you can see this little diagram on the right hand side. When I think of an agri-food system, I think of basically the collection of all the different agricultural value chains that link the, the farmer or primary agriculture all the way through to the final consumer or point of demand, where the, where, which markets are, um, the products are being sold in. And so if you take that lens, almost a, a collective value chain lens, um, you end up with roughly speaking, five major components in the agri-food system. Obviously, there is primary agriculture. So that's all the crops, the livestock, the forestry, the fishing, all of that sits within that gray box in the framework called primary agriculture. Um, primary agriculture does produce food, own consumption, so households producing and consuming their own food. But much of the output across the globe is, is being traded in markets. So it's leaving the farm, it's moving to either agro-processing, where it, it um, agro-processing, which is the yellow box in the figure, right? Or, um, or it's moving even further on to food services. Think restaurants and hotels where ready-made meals are being sold to, to consumers. And so in between that movement from agriculture to processing to food services and to the final consumer, there are the trade and transport um, services, the, the trading and transporting of food and agriculture-related products. So that's the fourth component. And the fifth are the input suppliers. 
Think about the domestically produced fuels and the fertilizers and the, the textile bags that maize is packed into. All of those are inputs and all of the production of those inputs generate jobs and incomes for people who are involved in those satellite industries that serve agriculture and agro-processing. So we can take this conceptualization of the agri-food system. And, and for some of you may have already noticed, I've not talked about the environment, I've not talked about justice, I've not talked about any of these other really crucial aspects of agri-food system transformation. I'm just focusing on what we can measure. And the advantage of this approach is that we can directly draw on countries' national accounts data. This is the data that countries use to measure their GDP and their employment. And we can take that information and we can assign values, how much GDP is being generated at each point within this framework, or how many jobs are being created at each point within this framework. And so although it is somewhat limited, it does allow us to measure the size and the composition of a country's agri-food system and to track how it's been changing over time. And so I can give you some indication of what the global agri-food system looks like. So we have estimated the size of the agri-food system for almost every country in the world. Um, and what you can see here is a result at the very global level of what, what how big the agri-food system is. So what, by our estimate, our latest number for 2021 is that the agri-food system accounts, it accounts for about $11.7 trillion worth of GDP. That's about 13% of the global economy. Um, and about two thirds of that GDP is being generated in developing countries. In terms of employment, and I'm not gonna to focus too much on employment in this particular presentation, but in terms of employment, the agri-food system generates about 1.3 billion jobs. Um, so it's a very large uh, share of the global workforce, about 40% 40, 40 of the global workforce, and the vast majority of people working in the agri-food system are in developing countries. So on, on the side, you have two figures. And on the left-hand side, what you can see is a breakdown of agri-food system across those five different components that I spoke about on the previous slide. And you can see, and it's, you can see globally, there's that 13% of GDP, right? So the 12.8, that is a share of the total global economy, total GDP in the world. And 12.8% of that is in the agri-food system. What jumps out to you straight away is that only 4.5% of the global economy is in primary agriculture. What that means is that the agri-food system is three times larger than just primary agriculture itself. For every dollar of GDP that is generated in primary agriculture in the world, there are two additional dollars that are being generated in the agri-food system beyond the farm. What the figure also does is break down the agri-food systems in low-income countries, LIC, all the way to high-income countries on the right, HIC. And you can see how the agri-food system overall is declining in importance as, and in more developed countries, right? So it's two-fifths of the economy in low-income countries, but only 8% of the economy in high-income countries. What you can also see in this figure is just the importance of primary agriculture in low-income countries, that it is still 28.5% of the economies in primary agriculture and 42% is in the agri-food system. On the right-hand side, you, in the second um, figure, you can see the, the, the breakdown, the shares of, um, of the agri-food system, of total agri-food system GDP in 2021. And you can see for low-income countries, two-thirds, 67.7%, of the agri-food system is still in primary agriculture, but that share falls to 17% for high-income countries. So for a high-income country, for every dollar you're generating in primary agriculture, you're getting four additional dollars in GDP off the farm in the agri-food system, whereas for low-income countries, it's $2 on the farm and $1 off the farm. So what you can see is that at, in more developed countries, and we can show as countries develop, more and more of the agri-food system happens beyond the farm. And that really is a very strong relationship around agri-food system transformation. So from an economic perspective, agri-food system transformation is very much about not only increasing productivity in primary agriculture, but watching the agri-food system extend further and further beyond the farm. We're having more and more value addition beyond the farm. We can look at how the agri-food system has grown over the last two decades, so from 2000 to 2021. And in this figure, we're looking at two things. Um, we're looking at the four different income country income groups, so low income, lower middle, upper middle, and high income from left to right. 
And within each of those groups, we're looking at how GDP and employment has been growing over the last two decades. And just to add one more complication, the green bar, for example, is uh, primary agricultural growth, our average annual growth rates, and the brown bars or the red bars are how fast the off-farm agri-food system has been growing. And so there are two things that I want to stress coming out of, out of um, in this particular figure. The first is that if we look at the middle income and high income countries in almost every case, whether we're looking at GDP or we're looking at employment, we see much faster growth in the off farm components of the agri food system than we do in primary agriculture. And you'll remember that expansion of the off farm is consistent with transformation. And so we're seeing fairly strong evidence of, of rapid transformation, um, agri-food system transformation in middle and high income countries. We've got faster off-farm GDP and employment growth than we have on the farm in primary agriculture. But if we look at low income countries on the left hand side, we have a bit more of a mixed, uh, mixed view on how things are changing. On the one hand, you can see employment off the farm is growing much faster than employment on the farm. So on-farm employment is still growing, reflecting continued rapid growth in rural populations, but growth off the farmers is much, much faster. We also, um, and so that would suggest workers are leaving low productivity agriculture, they're moving to, to other jobs off the farm, that would seem to suggest some evidence of transformation. But if we look at what's happening to GDP, we see the opposite story, that actually the on-farm is growing faster than the off-farm. Now, the good news is that agriculture is growing very strongly, right? And so it may be that this, the off-farm is not keeping up with rapid growth in agriculture. What it is also consistent with, particularly if we compare it to what's happening to employment in low-income countries, is we may have evidence of structural change, workers leaving agriculture without the industrialization in the food system that we have, that or the, the sort of growth in those off-farm components um, that drive transformation. So mixed or weak evidence of transformation um, in, in low-income countries. Um, now, if we think about the Feed the Future countries, many of them are low-income countries, about half of them are low-income countries, and the other half are lower middle-income countries. And so the question is just where are they sitting? In this, in this divide between what's happening to low income countries as a whole and lower middle income countries. And so that's part two of this presentation. Are agri-food systems transforming within the feed the future countries? And so to answer that question, we conducted a series of 21 country case studies. And these, these really are deep dives on what and unpacking what's been changing in agri-food systems in these, in these 21 countries. So again, we're gonna focus on measuring agri-food system GDP and employment, just like we've just seen for the global level. And we're gonna, but we're also going to go one step further. Instead of looking at the agri-food system as a whole, we're gonna unpack the agri-food system into its component value chains and say, which value chains have been driving agri-food system growth and possibly transformation in these countries? We're going to track changes just over the last decade, not because that's primarily the Feed the Future program years, but because um, we're stopping in 2019, because at the time when we did this work, the data was only available up till 2020. And everyone knows 2020 because of COVID was a very atypical year. And so we decided not to have that as the end point for our analysis. So we stopped in 2019. Today, we can go further. Um, Although there are 21 case studies, there's no way I can show you the deep dive results for each and every country. If you're interested in what we found for an individual country, you can, you can visit the IFPRI website um, and there's a link in the PowerPoints which will be shared with you, um, or you can find it on that webpage that's shown below on the IFPRI website. What I'm gonna do just to give you a feel for these deep dives is I'm going to pull out Kenya not because it's just in the middle of the map, but because it's, a, it's actually a fairly typical country that we found. There's a lot of variation across countries, and I'm gonna highlight that at the end, um, but, uh, but, but Kenya is fairly typical. And so I can use this as an example of just what are the big building blocks, the four big components of the analysis that we did in each country. And I'm gonna give you an example from Kenya for each of those four building blocks. So the first thing we did in each country's study is we did um, is we looked at at the agri-food system. How big is it? Uh, how much of the agri-food system is happening beyond the farm, et cetera? 
Um, and so you can see here, here's a picture of Kenya's agri-food system in 2019. And again, we see very much what we saw for, um, for low and lower middle income countries at the global level. We can see on in figure four on the left, um, you know, although agriculture is a very important part of Kenya's um, economy, around 23% of the overall GDP, um, the agri-food system is still much larger than that, right? Uh, well over a third of the economies in the agri-food system. And that's because once we factor in that downstream agro-processing, the food and agriculture related trade, we're adding much more GDP to the overall uh, contribution of the agri-food system. Um, Agri-food system employment is also very important in uh, in Kenya. Um, it's about 55% of the workforce. I'm not going to focus in on employment um, for, for much of the analysis that comes. Um, what you can see on the left-hand side in figure four is that Kenya sits somewhere in between, if we were to think of a very stylized fact, Kenya sits somewhere in between a low-income country and a lower-middle-income country. And that's perfectly consistent with Kenya having recently become a lower-middle-income country. So you can see that Kenya's um, the importance of primary agriculture in Kenya's economy is a little bit lower than low-income countries. It's a little bit higher than it is for lower-middle-income countries. And we see that growth in the off-farm. One thing I should point out is that across low income countries, what we are consistently seeing is um, fairly rapid growth in the off farm sectors dominated by particularly trade services. And we're going to see this in a second. And that's consistent with countries increasingly moving, low income countries increasingly moving from subsistence agriculture, where um, there is a direct, direct link from the products produced in primary agriculture to the products that households are consuming. What we're increasingly seeing is more and more products being marketed, which means more and more trade and transport services being uh, contributing to the agri-food system. And so as subsistence farming declines, we start to see an increase in trade and transport services. Um, and that's very much what we're seeing in East African countries like Kenya or low-income countries in general, is much of the growth in the agri-food system is coming from trade and transport services. Um, you can also see on in figure five on the right hand side, the share of agri food system GDP broken down the, the major contributions. And again, you can see that Kenya is very much aligned with other low and lower middle income countries. So the first thing we did in these case studies is looked at the overall agri food system and how it sits within the broader economy. The second thing we did is look at the agri food system from the demand side and from the supply side. So much of what I have focused on now is agri-food system GDP and employment, very much on the supply side, the production of food within the country. But what we also want to look at is what, what um, products are um, households consuming and what's where is the GDP coming from in those products, embedded within those products that households are consuming. So in figure six, we compare at a very high level what is the breakdown of agri-food system GDP, which is the, the pie chart on the left? And you can see here that around two thirds of the GDP in, in the overall agri-food system in Kenya is primary agriculture. We've just seen that on the previous slide. But if we look at consumption, the pie chart on the right, we can see that actually what consumers are um, spending on the products that, that are being consumed within the countries by household, by in Kenya by households, a much larger share of the value added embodied within the products that are being consumed is actually agro-processing. In other words, the country as a whole produces more primary agricultural um, output, but they're consuming a lot more processed products, right? And so how do they make up for the gap? Well, you can see that on the left-hand side and uh, on the right-hand side in figure seven, where we compare what is the value-added content of exports versus the value-added content of imports. And you can see on the left-hand side, um, about half, just less than half of the value added inside exports coming out of Kenya is from um, agro-processing, right? So these are processed products. In other words, a lot of the agricultural exports, the agri-food exports coming out of Kenya are primarily dominated by primary agriculture. These are primary agricultural products, generally speaking. But if we look at imports on the right-hand side, three quarters of the value added in the goods that have been imported come from agro-processing. So simply put, to put it very bluntly, Kenya is exporting primary agricultural products and it's importing processed 
agri-food products. And this is a very general, this is something you'll see in a second, is very common across all the countries that we've looked at. And we think um, it presents both an opportunity, but also a challenge for countries looking to drive transformation. So that's the second part of these diagnostics, is looking at demand and supply side. The key contribution of the diagnostics is unpacking the agri-food system across major value chain groups, right? And you can see here, this is what we're doing. Um, we're decomposing the agri-food system into three groups of value chains. So although inside our data set, we have information on very detailed products and um, at, at the farm level and processed and all the way into the market, what we're doing is we're creating broad groups of value chains. And so we're going to divide value chains in Kenya and in all the countries into three broad categories or groups. The first group are the export-oriented value chains. So when we look at the data, these are value chains who export have an above average export to output ratio. So for example, if, if Kenya ex if on average Kenya exports um if for a value, if a value chain exports 75, 80% of its output, then this is clearly an export oriented value chain. The second group are our import substituting value chains. These are ones where um, these are domestic, domestic producers, but they're supplying goods into markets where it's imports that are dominating, relatively speaking, right? So if you are importing um, 75, 80% of your poultry, then clearly the poultry value chain can be classified as an import substituting value chain, right? And then finally, we've got all the other value chains, the ones that are sort of neither strongly export oriented or neither strongly import substitution, import or uh, competing oriented. These are the less traded products, the ones that really are being produced locally and are supplying local markets and local consumers. And you can see in figure eight, um, a breakdown of Kenya's agri-food system GDP. So this is both the GDP on the farm and beyond the farm and the broader food system along each of these different value chains. And you can see that we've got um, two broad groups of export-oriented value chains that we identified based on the criteria above. We've got fruits and nuts, and we've got tea, coffee, flowers, all the traditional export crops. It's no surprise that those turn out to be more export-oriented. We also have a group of import substituting value chains. Think of rice, think of poultry and eggs and so on, oil seeds. These are ones where imports make up a large share of what's being supplied into the domestic market. And so our local producers are having to compete against those imports um, when they're supplying domestic markets. And then finally, the bulk of Kenya's agri-food system is made up of what we're, we're calling less traded value chains, chains that are largely produced and serving domestic markets. Um, the key thing here when we look at Kenya's value chains and we break down how much in each of these groups of value chains, how much of the value added has been generated on the farm versus off the farm. Remember, agri-food system transformation across countries is strongly associated with that off-farm push, that expansion of the off-farm components of the agri-food system. And so when we look at these three broad groups of value chains in figure nine, we can see how much of the value added is being generated in primary agriculture, the gray bar, and how much is being generated in those off-farm components of the agri-food system, the black bar. And what you can see is actually when it comes to export-oriented value chains, very little of the value added is being generated, has in, uh, is being includes very little of the total value added in those value chains is actually coming from those off-farm components, right? Most of the export-oriented value chains are generating GDP in primary agriculture. But that's not true for the import substituting value chains. You can see more than half of the value added in an import substituting value chain is, is being generated um, by off the farm. So if we think about um, which are the kinds of value chains that have that strong off farm component that can help drive um, transformation, we're seeing fairly clear evidence that the import substituting value chains have a significant um, off-farm component and maybe more consistent with transformation. We'll come back to that in a second. And then the less traded products are somewhere in between. Um, you know, more off-farm value addition than export, uh, export value chains, less off-farm value addition than import substituting. So this provides us crucial, crucial information on the value chain building blocks that make up the value, the agri-food system in a country like Kenya, but also starts to give us some indication of which are the value chains that could really help drive that off-farm expansion of the value chain. And then finally, 
um, we have this idea of how have uh, this, the fourth component of the uh, case studies, which is looking at how the agri-food system has actually been changing over the last decade. So everything up until now has been a 2020, a 2019 snapshot. Now we're looking at looking back over the decade and looking at how the agri-food system has has transformed, if it has. And we can see here in this figure 10, um, the growth rates of the export-oriented value chains, the second set of columns, the import substituting value chains, the third set, and then finally on the right, the less traded value chains. And what you can see clearly, uh, the gray bars are total agri-food system growth, so that's the whole value chain. And then the green bars break down how fast is that growth in these value chains happening on the farm versus off the farm, the red bars. And what you can see ac across, the, across all three value chains is there is much stronger growth in those off-farm components of all the different value chains. And so that suggests that we're having transformation, not just at, of the overall agri-food system in Kenya, but we've got transformation happening within each of these different groups of value chains. However, what you can also see um, is that the export-oriented value chains have not been performing particularly well, primarily because there hasn't been as much um, on-farm um, value addition or growth taking place in Kenya. So this gives us this, these four different building blocks in these in these diagnostics provide us with a very rich set of information to to, to about each country's agri food system and trust me each agri food system is quite unique um, and you'd see that if you look at, at just a handful of the different diagnostic studies. Um, but there are some common patterns that are coming out. And so this brings us to the final part of this presentation, which is having conducted, we've, we've looked at Kenya, but having conducted similar analysis for 20 other countries, what are the general lessons that are emerging across these, the, these 21 countries? And so, um, and this really, this brings us to the to four slides that really are the substance of this presentation, the four lessons that we have learned um, from across our, our country studies. And I'm afraid I'm going to be showing lots and lots of scatter plots. And the reason for that is just because that's the best way to show you where each country sits in relation to each other. Um, but it really is a summary of the kind of analysis that we've just seen in the Kenya case study example. So what are we what is our first lesson? Well, I think what we've what we've seen is um, across the countries that um, off farm growth is really helping drive um, ag agricultural transformation. So if we look in panel A, what we're looking at here is um, what this figure is showing us is that, you know, primary agriculture still dominates most of the feed the future countries agri food systems. So on the vertical axis in figure A, we've got agriculture share of the agri food system GDP. So how much of the agri food system GDP is still being generated in primary agriculture? And you can see that for most of the countries, it's still the majority share, right? Well over 60, 50 percent of value added, depending on whether these are low income feed the future countries or middle income, the green, the green dots. Um, DRC, which is whose uh, whose code is COD, um, the DRC and Zambia ZMB, these are a little bit outliers, and I can go into that if anyone's interested. Um, it's, it's a bit technical, but happy to to describe that. But for the most part, um, most of the feed the future countries have a very high share of primary agriculture in their agri food system. In panel B, we look at how the agri-food system has been growing. And we, again, we want to make this comparison between on-farm growth versus off-farm growth. And so off-farm growth is in the vertical axis of panel, panel B, right? And on-farm growth is in the horizontal axis. And what you can see is that many of the countries are actually sitting above the line, that the off-farm growth is faster than the on-farm growth in the agri-food system. And this is good news. Because this suggests that in most of the countries, not all, but in most of Feed the Future countries, we have evidence of um, agricultural transformation, at least as far as an economist would define it, right? Um, or a development me, as I would define it. Um, there are some countries where that's not the case. Think of Nepal, which is sitting um, around about 4% agricultural growth, but only 2% off-farm agricultural growth, uh, GDP growth. But the good news is that even in a country like Nepal, we're seeing fast agricultural growth. And so we're still seeing some aspects of agricultural growth, even if it's not fully consistent with our definition of agricultural transformation. So what does this mean for us um, as we design investment portfolios or give advice to governments? I think the key thing here is that 
you know, when we talk about taking an agri-food system lens to our investment programming, our policy reforms, we need to pay attention explicitly to both the on-farm and the off-farm components of the value chains that we're supporting or the broader agri-food system. A lot of the times in um, national ag investment plans that I see coming from governments, there's a talk about value addition and there's a talk about value chain development, but still a lot of the investments are being targeted primarily to primary agriculture, to farming. And I think we need to pay um, more attention, I wouldn't say as much, but more attention to market development, agro processing and so on. And I think we need to see see the budgets shift in that favor, as well as the words that are being used um, in the writing of these documents and our policy plans. The second lesson that we learned, it focuses really on agricultural exports. And one of the things that is very clear across all the country studies is just how narrowly concentrated agricultural exports are in all of the countries. So it's not like all the value chains are exporting a similar amount of their output. In fact, there's just a handful of value chains that are exporting most a large share of their output. And you can see that here in figure C, that this is looking at what share of output is being exported. And, if, and the horizontal line is the share for all agricultural value chains in a country. And the vertical is the share for the more export oriented value chains. And you can see that compared to the overall agri-food system, there are a handful of product value chains that really are targeting the export market versus, um, and, and so what that means then is that um, we have a very small set of products that are really driving agricultural exports. It's not an orientation for the broader agri-food system in the Feed the Future countries. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but if we look in panel D and look at how export-oriented value chains have been performing over the last decade, what we see is that in many cases, the, the growth in the export-oriented value chains has been slower than the growth in the overall agri-food system, suggesting that export-oriented value chains are lagging behind, right? And you can see that in the figure here. On the horizontal axis, we've got how fast are all the value chains growing in a country, and on the, on the vertical axis, just the growth in the export-oriented value chains. And in many countries, again, not in all, but in many countries, many of the countries fall below the, that um, diagonal line, meaning that the overall agri-food system is growing faster than the export value chains. What's the implication of this? Well, again, if we go back to countries' national ag investment plans, there is often a singular focus on agricultural exports and, and this belief that agricultural exports can grow particularly fast because they're tapping into large global markets. And that may be true for certain, certain value chains, and it certainly is true theoretically, but what we're seeing in the in, across the Feed the Future countries is, is not that very rapid runaway growth in the agricultural export value chains. Um, what we're actually seeing is a more steady growth in the broader um, agri-food system. And so that means that while we do need to, to encourage, the implications are that while we do need to try and diversify agricultural exports, um, and we do need to make agricultural exports grow faster, what we haven't been seeing is, is uh, growth and transformation in the agri-food systems in the Feed the Future countries being dominated by agricultural exports. And that actually brings me nicely to lesson three. In fact, it's not exports, but it's often the domestic oriented value chains that are driving agri-food system growth. So what you can see here on, in this figure is the share of growth in the agri-food system that comes from those less traded value chains, those are in green, from the import substi substituting value chains, which is in the red or the brown, and then finally the export oriented value chains in gray. And there are some countries, Myanmar, Mozambique, Mali, where a very large share of the growth in, the agri in their agri-food systems has been driven by these more export-oriented value chains. But if we look across all the countries, that is not the case, right? That in many countries, the vast majority of the growth that has happened in the agri-food system has been driven by the production of goods servicing local markets and local consumers, right? It's those domestic-oriented value chains that are the main source of agri-food system growth. So not only were these, as we saw earlier, not only are these value chains, these domestic oriented value chains um, bigger to begin with, but they're actually contributing a much larger share. They've grown faster than those export oriented value chains. Um, 
And so what does this mean for us as we do investment planning? Well, it means that um, you know, we need to pay very close attention to what's happening, not just to export markets and export opportunities, but we need to pay very close attention to what's happening to household consumption patterns, how fast are household incomes and demand for food growing, and what are the kinds of foods consumers are increasingly wanting? Because it appears that these are going to be the uh, potential, the large potential growth markets for Feed the Future countries in the coming decades, right? It's it's this what's happening in domestic markets that really should be um, a key determinant of what we choose to prioritize our investments towards. Finally, our lesson four, and I think this is the one that is perhaps um, most of a challenge to convince our government partners and, and maybe also many of you, and that is that actually it's the import substituting value chains that could really help us accelerate transformation, but which we think haven't been receiving as much attention as perhaps they should be. So what we can see in this figure, uh, figure F, the final figure, I promise that I'm going to show, is a comparison between how much of the um, value added, the GDP that's generated in each of these value chains, how much are these groups of value chains, how much is coming off the farm? Remember, we're wanting foster off-farm growth because that's associated with foster agricultural transformation from an, eco from an economic point of view. And on the on the top figure on the right hand side, this is a comparison of import substitutable value chains and export oriented value chains. And the figure is showing what share of the value added is coming off the farm. And so you can see for the import substitutable value chains, which is on the, the vertical axis, the share of off farm value added in these value chains total output or total GDP is quite high. Right. Remember, a lot of the value added inside the products that are being um, that our local producers are having to compete against, a lot of the value added is, is actually in processing and downstream value addition. If we compare that to export oriented value chains, it's significantly lower for, for export oriented value chains. For most of the, the shares are much higher for imports than they are for export value chains. Most of the countries on average um, are above the diagonal line. And that's a key point here, because although a lot of the strategies, um, national ag investment plans and strategies focus squarely on promoting exports and generating dollars, new dollars from, from exporting agricultural products, agri-food products, in reality, it's the import substituting value chains that offer much greater potential to reduce our dependence on value addition that's happening in other countries. Right. And so what that means then is that if we can substitute um, for imports through domestic production and compete with those imports, we have much greater potential to generate more value added beyond the farm. Um, and that, that's a crucial insight. The same is actually true for the less traded, which is the bottom figure in on the right hand side. It's also true for the less traded um, products as well. So it's not just import substituting, it's actually targeting some of those less traded products as well. They also have more value added in the less traded value chains than we do in the export oriented value chains. So what's the, what's the implication of this? And I think this is quite important. And that is that you know we need to promote value chains that not only, not only export value chains, but we really need to be doing a better job at promoting value chains that can substitute for imports. Um, there are a number of reasons why this might be a good thing, um, a good opportunity. On the one hand, it may be easier for domestic producers to compete in their own domestic market against imports than it is to be competitive in, a, in an export market um, thousands of miles away. Right. And so we might have uh, in many of the feed the few countries, there might be a real um, strategic advantage to, to competing against imports as opposed to singly focusing on exports. The second is that. Um, it does require uh, a bit of a shift. In most of the ag strategies and policies that I have looked at, that governments have, have been producing, there has been this, this dominant view that export agriculture is key, that earning that additional dollar through exports is crucial. But saving a dollar by substituting for imports can be as important um, for the balance of payments, but also even more important for driving transformation beyond the farm. So that's what I think probably the most important insight, practical insight for us as we work with countries, as we give policy advice, as we design our country investment plans and programs, that we need to pay as much attention to the import substituting value chains as we do to the export oriented value chains. So let me summarize very quickly and then I will stop. Um, we've hopefully convinced you that although we've taken a, a 
very economics view of, of what is an agri-food system and what agri-food system transformation means, I hope you feel that there is at least some added insights. Again, let me stress, I'm not talking about transformation in the broader sense. I have not talked about the environment. I've not talked about inclusion. So sort of how inclusive are, is the agricultural system in these Feed the, Feed the Future countries. I will say one thing is that if you do go to the individual country studies, you will see a section in those studies, which I haven't spoken about, which is forward looking. And there we do say, which are the future sources of agricultural growth? Which of those value chains that we have looked at are most, con most effective in driving poverty reduction, improving diet quality at the household level? I haven't talked about that today, but that's there in those country reports and you may find that interesting. Instead, what I'm focused on today is drawing out these four big lessons. Right, that we have seen across the, the, the 21 case studies. And because we're looking across countries, they are somewhat stylized. The first lesson is, and hopefully something you do take away, is that when, when often when development economists talk about agricultural transformation, it's that more rapid expansion of growth beyond the farm in the processing, the trade, et cetera. And our conclusion is that we really do need to pay more attention um, to some of those off-farm components of the food system. Um, both in terms of our strategies, but also the investments that we make. The second lesson is around agricultural exports, and I'm not going to war with agricultural exports. I think they're absolutely a crucial building block to a, a national ag um, development plan. But I do think we perhaps put too much emphasis on those on, on agricultural exports as the way out of low income and lower middle income status. Um, I think what we're seeing is these agricultural exports in many of the Feed the Future countries are quite narrow. Right, quite narrowly concentrated in a very small set of products, um, but that uh, they are not always um, because so much of the of these exports are driven by primary agriculture rather than processing. They are limited in how much they can drive that broader transformation beyond the farm. Lesson number three, and this was a surprise to us, just how important those domestic oriented value chains have been in driving agri food system growth over the last decade. And it does mean that we need to pay a lot more attention to those, these, these value chains that are serving domestic markets and domestic consumers. And then finally, um, we really want to make a case for import substituting value chains and just how important we're seeing these could be in driving uh, accelerating transformation in the feed the future countries. They may be as effective um, at driving transformation and even more effective at driving transformation and creating our farm jobs. So those are the four high level summaries and I hope this has been a useful um, presentation. Again, the lessons are fairly general and I'm looking forward to hearing what, what you are seeing, or what you are thinking and how this relates to the country you are in. Um, so thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to two colleagues of mine. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Valeria Pinheiro, who is a trade economist here at IFPRI, to give her thoughts on, on some of the lessons that we've learned from the, from the country studies. And then I'm going to hand over to Kwao um, Andam, who is in our Nigeria program, who's been using some of these analyses together with the Nigerian government to help inform some of the strategy. So Valeria, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, James. Um... And thank you for for inviting me here to to share with you some of my um, thoughts related with this work and how we can apply it uh, to the countries we do study. And thank you all for for joining. So I think that I I have only five minutes, so I will concentrate in four points uh, that I think that it will complement a little bit of what uh, James just uh, mentioned. So the first one is that. One of the um, big challenges for us as ag economists, agricultural economists, is that now we are not only talking about the agricultural sector or analyzing and figuring out what to do with the agricultural sector, but with the food system, as James was mentioning. So these kind of diagnostics that James just showed, really they are very, very helpful in giving us that diagnostic, no? so to really point out where the things are across the whole value chain. So we have in the farm or on the farm, on the move and off the farm. And, uh, and those, um, those relationships are very important. But then the second one is that 
also we are uh, in a bigger uh, complexity in the sense that now we're not only asking the agricultural sector to produce uh, more and increase productivity, but we also are asking them to look at how can we produce in a sustainable way. And so when we're talking about sustainability, we have three pillars. So James really concentrated today in the first one that is the economic one, but we also have the environmental one and uh, the social one. And in the social one, we can talk about nutrition, poverty, and so forth. So when we're looking at this sustainability, uh, we need to start thinking about what is the role of trade in, uh, in this um, discussion. So that goes to my third point in that when we look at diets, we have to look at diets um, not only as a, as a whole um, package, but also the diversity of these diets and also the quality of the goods that you're consuming. Um, and when we're talking about the quality, we really need to make sure that we're not counting only calories, but we're also con uh, counting all the uh, fat, proteins, and so forth that really adds to the quality of that, but also the safety. So um, um, that is part of also the transformation of the uh, food system in how this food that you provide, it's also safety uh, and, and covers uh, those issues as well. The other component that it is very important is that diets have to be affordable and accessible. So that is the other uh, connection in which comes to um, become very clear the connection between trade, food security, and nutrition. And as well, we need to look at the nexus between the trade, climate change, and nutrition. And while we do all that, uh, there are always some synergies and some trade-offs that come along with this uh, discussion. And I think that that's why this kind of work is very helpful in making more clear what are those uh, trade-offs and what are those synergies and how we can create uh, or help designing these interventions that would help reduce those trade-offs and make those synergies move together. So how can we uh, make sure that we talk to the policymakers and also the private sector in, again, creating those proper interventions that are well designed and that will also be helpful in the implementation of them. So when we're talking about the production side, of course that increased uh, investment is key, but again, what it is the, the whole purpose of that is how can we create those right interventions and right incentives for the producers not uh, to adopt those technologies. How we do that, we need to, of course, uh, provide uh, that they will be profitable and so forth. But the design of those interventions are key to make sure that we eliminate those trade-offs between the three pillars of uh, sustainability. And I think that uh, my last uh, point that I would like to, to mention here is that all these studies really concentrated in uh, less developed countries more than anything. Um, and most of them, as James was pointed out, they are uh, net food importers. But I think that it will be very relevant to as well do these kind of deep dives into the net uh, food uh, in, uh, exporters. Because again, trade, it's a key, uh, plays a key role in trying to um, move forward this development in food importers, but if we look at what the food net exporters are doing and in which they are already in a different uh, um, stage in this transformation of the food system, there are a lot of lessons uh, that we can uh, learn uh, from that. Um, and with this also, we don't have to start thinking about how we solve problems in each of these independent countries. But remember that sustainability, it is not inside their borders, but it's across borders uh, in terms of environmental, but also in this diet diversity that I was uh, mentioning previously. So how can we uh, learn from other countries? And as well, how can we come up with this planning or how to produce in a sustainable way, uh, having some cooperation uh, between between uh, countries and again across borders. And let me stop here. I'm looking forward to the QA later. Thank you. Thank you, James and Valeria. So, um, to pick up 
you here. Um, as James you know, described earlier, one of the benefits, I think, of this study, these studies is that it really helps policymakers to see clearly the changing nature of the country's agri-food system. And here in Nigeria, this has become increasingly relevant over the past three years as with other countries um, facing global shocks, but also with local shocks that have um, contributed, I believe, to a rethinking of the country's uh, development path. The most recent um, uh, shocks uh, are fallouts from some necessary reforms, um, removing regressive fuel subsidies and um, unifying the uh, official and parallel exchange rate. Now, in the wake of those uh, reforms and um, following those, um, food security is now high on the agenda since last year, um, with more you know, recent uh, really rapid growth in uh, inflation, nearly 30 percent, uh, highest in decades. Um, and so you can imagine how that's bringing attention to this, this issue of, uh, of the transformation of the agri-food system. So for us in, in IFPRI, uh, with our country presence and funded by USAID and other donors, we have been contributing to this discussion here in Nigeria through several engagements with the government of Nigeria. I'll mention three here and then give a couple of reflections. So first, we, we started off using these, the findings from these studies in the country in presentations last year to the um, presidential advisory committee during the transition of administrations, uh, the part of the committee on agriculture and food security. And we were pleased to see a subsequent announcement of the development agenda in which food security is a priority. And then secondly, um, since last year, we have had various interactions now with the um, Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security on what the government's food security agenda entails and what that means for, um, for, for the development agenda. And then lastly, early this year, the, the Vice President of Nigeria opened a high-level forum on agriculture um, and food systems. Um, and in the technical section, we presented the study findings for, for Nigeria to policymakers. So reflecting on, on all of these engagements since last year and the responses from policymakers, I think just to pick two, um, two, two reflections. I think one of the, the lessons um, is that if you look at lesson number two in what James presented in terms of the concentration of agricultural um, exports, that's really an issue for Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the countries and, and the points on the very left of, of that diagonal. Um, which is uh, comparing export oriented to, uh, to all the other um, ag value chains. And so that's still worrying for policymakers. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that has been recognized in the past, I think. And I think with um, the recent crisis and these kinds of engagements, I think is becoming um, more and more, um, that, that understanding is shared more broadly among policymakers. And so that, that, that point about Ag exports for Nigeria, it's still um, still, still relevant um, in re um, reducing a bit the concentration in, in very few um, uh, very few value chains. So that's the first reflection. And then the second one is on uh, the, the lesson that James, lesson number four in James's presentation, um, the, um, the, the potential for using local value chains uh, to substitute for imports and having that drive um, agri-food system transformation. And I think just to share that that's very relevant for Nigeria at the, um, this recent high-level forum, the vice president uh, said a lot about the importance of agriculture for generating jobs. Um, and that ambition really can be fulfilled if, um, if we think about this, uh, this lesson for uh, import substituting value chains. Two quick examples on, on import substitution for Nigeria that have been um, that have come up in the Ag Ministry's um, recent policy uh, implementation, policy reformulation. Um, aquaculture, um, uh, um, ensure that, ensuring that policy drives aquaculture growth, which would feed um, local markets. And secondly, more recently, um, uh, dairy, uh, dairy, um, dairy production. So um, just to emphasize that these studies uh, have been very helpful for policymakers several countries and especially here in Nigeria um, to address these questions at this, this crucial time. Uh, thank you very much. And back to you, um, James.
Thank you. Every, uh, thank you so much, uh, James and colleagues. And I think now we are entering the Q&A session. And I have personally so many questions uh, on this very interesting and very timely presentation, as you can see from the chat. Uh, it is it's really a very interesting and timely. And James, before I get into the uh, attendees questions, just one quick question to you and the colleagues. The data that you looked at on the off farm, did you consider other activities that could, depending on improving it, will support the off farm activities? such as food loss and waste uh, actions, food safety improvement, regret environment, because I'm reflecting on a re recent report reviewed from the uh, related, which they took a deep dive on the AU food safety incidents and rejection and retain for products from the export side. And I wonder if that was taken into consideration. In other words, if we improve food loss and waste management and handling, reducing it, if we improve food safety, would that affect the export oriented as well as the regionally and domestically traded products? I think that's an excellent question. Um, it's not something that we looked at in these studies, but I do think there are some positives that come from developing countries trying to access export markets. And if one of those things are the food safety standards that are imported um, and are sort of being applied in, in developing countries, then I do think there are some positive implications of that in terms of making food safety something that is more broadly uh, a concern across both not just exports, but also value chains that are serving the domestic market. And, um, but actually Valeria is probably far more qualified to talk about trade and the role of sort of export standards in, in sort of helping lift up standards within countries, uh, developing countries across the board. Um, I don't know Valeria, if you have any other insights on that. Hey James, um, not too much, but I think that it is this uh, last comment that I had in terms of how we as the world need to really work together um, because again, this goes around what are the right uh, interventions. Um, and when you talk about intervention, what are the right incentives for producers? So I think that if they do have the right incentives, they will move along with that. Um, so that is it's, it's very uh, straightforward in that sense. But I think that it's, um, um, right now, for example, uh, the ministerial conference from the WTO is going on right now in Abu Dhabi. They are talking about many different things. One of the things that it would be interesting or important to do is how this thing about its standards and certifications, uh, environmental certification, or even labeling uh, could be included somehow in that discussion. But that requires collaboration, cooperation, and of course that agreeing on different uh, things as a global, um, um, globally, not just independently by each country. So I think that that is uh, something interesting. The other important thing is this thing about certifications um, or standards, they are very important in which they will assure you not only the safety, but also in terms of environmental uh, issues as well. But there are now too many, so that there are many advantages that we need to look at, but we also need to make sure that we cover the cost so again, like if we have just a less amount of um, um, different kind of uh, standards out there, it will be better because it will decrease the cost for the producers. The same thing goes with labeling. Uh, it is proven uh, right now that many labeling systems that they've been going on, uh, like I, I know the ones in Latin America, Chile, Mexico, they've really been very, very helpful in reducing the um, consumption from products that they are not good for uh, for the health. Um, but that may be uh, extra cost for exporters because they will need to put a different label in each of their packages, depending on which market they go to. So we need to find solutions for that if we really want to make sure that the producer, the person that it is really producing the uh, the goods are uh, profitable and that that will be a good incentive for them to do that extra work, that extra cost, but that they will benefit them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we received so many questions. I don't think we have time, and I apologize for the attendee audience to answer all of them, but I will uh, try to tackle as many as possible. Um, do I see a hand raised uh, from Kuawa? Yes, if I can just add quickly on that, that one ahead. question about, um, about uh, 
or certification and standards and, and so on. Just to add that, I think an important part of that discussion for developing countries, especially in Africa, has to be um, technologies on the front end that can reduce the need for, let's say, pest management uh, uh, um, uh, control, which then brings in some of the, um, the, the, the trade restrictions, right, when, when these pest management um, uh, technologies are used. So technologies on the front end, investing public resources to develop uh, technologies that can make um, that can make uh, uh, crops um, uh, resistant to, to pests without applying as much pest um, control will be helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Very very insightful. Um, there is two questions which are related. I'm going to ask them together, um, and the, the, it has to do with looking at low and middle income countries or low income countries. As James, you said, about half of the countries still in the low income countries, and we are transforming. And the importance of own production and consumption of the food in low income countries or low income settings. Uh, the questions go as around what or uh, how is that comparing to low uh, to middle to high income countries in terms of the analysis? Did you take into account the, local, the own production and consumption as well as? Uh, how this study would have looked different if it was taken into account the social anthropologist looked at the food system versus an economist lens. Um, also, uh, the second leg of the question is, have you looked at the emission from different parts of the food systems? If a growth in transport and trade sector is something visible, uh, what are the implications of the emission, uh, greenhouse gas emission in that sector? Over. No, thanks, Ahmed, and thanks thanks to, to the person who asked the question. I think, um, so firstly, let me say that home consumption is factored into our analysis. It is part of the numbers that we use when, when countries measure GDP and so on. And for many low-income countries, where a large share of what is produced in primary agriculture is directly consumed by farmers and their households, um, it's a fairly, fairly sizable share of primary agriculture in those countries. And so um, it, in low-income countries, um, uh, national statisticians go to great lengths to make sure that they're capturing the value of that of that own consumption in the numbers that are used to report um, the overall economy. So, so those numbers are in, and we get that information from household surveys that track that um, household's production and consumption of food. Um, it is incredibly important um, to, to take that into account. In low-income countries, it's quite a high share of the food that is consumed is own produced. But as countries develop, and certainly what we've seen in Africa um, over the last um, few decades or last couple of decades, we've seen quite a rapid decline in the share of food that is own, own produced. More and more households are engaging in markets. More and more farmers are engaging markets and selling their products. And, and so that's a very important part of the story of the transformation that's taking place in low-income countries. And as I said, as, as we move from being subsistence to being marketed, we get that growth opportunity in the markets and the trade and the transport that have very much been driving a lot of the, the growth and transformation in, in places like, like Eastern and, and Southern Africa over the last couple of decades. So, so um, subsistence is important for households. Moving from subsistence to marketed agriculture is important for the broader economy as well. And so, and so we, we need to, to, to to, to sort of weigh that off in our assessment, in our diagnostic. Um, I'm happy to talk about emissions, but I don't know if Valeria or Quau want to jump on that question or, or would you like me to have a crack at it? I'll have a crack at it. You can jump in if, if you think. Um, about this. We, we are not tracking emissions um, in, in this particular analysis, but I do think it's something which we are moving towards trying to track. Um, we have other studies and other groups at IFPRI that are tracking that together with other colleagues um, in the CG and, and our partners. And I think it is going to become increasingly a constraint in the choices that we make. It's not commonly factoring. With the countries where I work, with the governments I'm, I'm often working with, I'm not seeing emissions within the ministries of agriculture often being a primary determinant of what to do and what not to do. Um, but I think increasingly coming from the top down, we're going to start seeing directives that encourage ministries of agriculture to factor in what they are contributing in terms of emissions. Stepping back, I think in many of the countries, particularly the Feed the Future countries that are still low income countries, 
most of the emissions are still coming from on the farm. They're coming from land clearing, land use change, and so on. So we should be worried about the emissions that are going to come from the transport of the more developed food system. And we should be worried about the emissions that come from the energy that drives cold storage and other things. But right now, I think the, the focus is really on the decisions that are going to be made about land use in, in the future. And I think we've got a fantastic opportunity. You know, these investments haven't happened yet. This transformation is underway. We still have an opportunity to use policies and investments to guide the future pathway. And that includes the emissions that are going to be produced from, from food systems in, in developing countries. I see Valeria, your hands up, sorry. Yeah, I think that you have a great point. And, and just to, to add on that, uh, we are in the perfect situation now to really, we know we do have data, we have more information. And more than anything, there are technologies out there so they are there. It's just a matter of adopting them in ways that, as Quan was mentioning, there are many things that we already know that they work. And it's just a matter of how we will make sure that producers will adopt them uh, to just increase uh, uh, or reduce the level of emissions per unit of output. Um, so it's just a matter of learning from countries that maybe they already went through that process, making sure that we do that connection between countries that they look alike in terms of uh, um, natural resource endowment, uh, um, geography, uh, climate, and so forth, and make sure that we do that connection. So we learn and we try to make sure that we can uh, create those right incentives for producers to adopt those technologies that, again, they are out there. The other thing is doing, I don't know, multi-cropping now so that you don't, we don't have to do more land extension, the better use of fertilizer, uh, no-till technologies, and so forth, so that they are very simple ones. Um, uh, and it's just a matter of finding the way of uh, making sure producers uh, will adopt them. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, I have a question. Uh, uh, I have to say the previous question was from Anonymous, so I did not know who asked this question. Question from Zeek Joshua. What are the key driver agri-food system transformation and are these drivers the same across these countries, high and low income countries? It's a great question. It's a challenging question. Actually, um, in some parallel work that we've done since we did these case studies, we've looked more broadly at other um, indicators of transformation. So I've, uh, in this presentation, given a lot of emphasis to growth beyond the farm. And, and I want to make sure that I'm not, not saying this is everything that we should be focusing on. There is still growth on the farm that is absolutely crucial to, to um, developing uh, low-income countries uh, and so on. So um, looking at, at, you know, when we did the supporting work, we drew on what we saw from, from what I've presented today and looked at patterns of growth beyond the farm. And we are seeing across, across developing countries and across the food, the future countries, we are seeing faster growth beyond the farm. So that is some positive indication. It's not true in every country. Some countries are, are, are backsliding a little bit, but for the most part, in the bulk of low-income countries and feed the future countries, we've got that growth beyond the farm. When we look at what's happening on the farm, we are seeing evidence of rising productivity for staple foods, right? Which is really in many ways that first building block getting us from subsistence to marketed agriculture. So we're seeing strong evidence that in many developing countries, that staple productivity, that land productivity is rising. We're also seeing increases in agricultural labor productivity more generally, right? And so that's another positive indicator of, of transformation beyond just growth beyond the farm. What we are not seeing um, in, in low and in lower middle income countries, but what we think is important for transformation is a diversification within agriculture to higher value added value chains, so more higher value agriculture. So we've got rising productivity for staple crops, which is good for hunger reduction. We've got increased growth beyond the farm, which is good for job creation and so on. And we've got increasing incomes within agriculture more generally but we're not seeing yet that move up the ladder to high value agriculture um, in, in low income countries, including in the feed the future. And I think that is a real puzzle for us. It, it may reflect the fact that increasingly developing countries are importing the high value agriculture and exporting the low value agriculture, which is something we saw in the case studies today. But that's something we don't want to see continue forever. Uh, we need to turn the corner on that. We need to empower developing countries to supply some of their own growing markets as opposed to becoming dependent on imports. I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, thank you. 
And I just want to point out there are several questions that are answered live in the Q&A. So for those who ask questions, they can refer to that. Uh, a question for anonymous uh, attendees. Would you conclude from the four lessons to support economic uh, protectionism in agri-food system? And how does that fit in the, to the benefit of multilateralism? Let me say something, and then I think Valeria is uniquely qualified to talk about protectionism versus multilateralism. But um, I think, again, I think it's at the margin. I think there are clear benefits to, to being part of global markets, to having access to those export opportunities and to, um, you know, having access to more varied products that are available through imports. And I'll let Valeria talk more about the benefits of that. Um, I think where, where I am cautioning, where our analysis suggests we need to be a little bit cautious is that um, we don't want countries to become dependent on, on imported high value products, products that are typically associated with transformation. When I was a student many years ago, we learned about coming from South Africa, um, we learned a lot about dependency theory, right? How uh, from, from Latin America, again, I should let Valeria talk more than me, but but about this theory that developing countries were becoming trapped in low productivity agriculture. Um, and, and I'm not going to sort of, it's a very political um, theory and I'm not going to sort of fully subscribe to everything about it, but I think there is some lessons, some concerns that we can learn from that, from those theories, some a, a potential trap that we want to make sure our developing countries uh, feed the future, all countries, mine included, don't want to find themselves in that low value sort of export oriented trap where, where you're importing the goods that really would be most beneficial for you to produce domestically for your broader development process. And I think, so it's not saying, oh, we should become protectionist, but it means that we should use our policies and our investments to, to bolster some of the industries that are gonna help us compete against imports and equip our producers to be competitive um, in for the future, as opposed to what I'm seeing in a lot of countries right now in their ag strategies, which is we need dollars to make up for our terribly bad balance of payments situations. And we're going to look to agriculture to generate those dollars, even if it means in the long run, we're sacrificing our transformation prospects. But again, I should come back to Valeria and, and Quau. Nigeria is right in the middle of this with it, some of its protectionist policies. I'm sure you've got some thoughts as well. Um, thank you, James. For <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that uh, this question also has to be really be answered depending on the region and depending on the country we're talking about. We need to first of all look at the comparative advantage of the country and if it is possible with the right investment to really increase productivity and, and so forth. So again, protectionism is not something, um, as James was pointed out, that we're trying to say with this, but it is how, what are the opportunities of each of these countries can have? Given that we're talking about the agricultural sector, we have to be really careful that we look into consideration the natural resources endowments that each of these countries have. Um, remember that uh, we need to take care of the environment, so each country should be producing what they are capable of doing given the resources that they have and the best way of doing it. So in Africa, for example, um, um, one of the big uh, constraints that they have is lower productivity, lower TFP, uh, total factor productivity, and smaller number of yields uh, for that. So in these cases, it is totally true, right investment will help in promoting that. Now, in terms of multilateralism, that, that is something that he was asked for. Uh, of course, that if we have a um, free, um, so there will be no tariffs, no nothing, automatically uh, goods will move to maximize and get the best uh, efficiency. We're not at that point, um, but we need to really work towards that because what happens is, for example, I don't know, with the export restrictions that these days uh, have been imposing, what it creates is a lot of volatility. So in general prices, if they are high, depending, some people will lose or not, but it's not creating a lot of trouble. The same thing with lower. What it really creates a lot of uh, in uncertainty for producers is the volatility. So creating this kind of um, policy that it comes just from one country, it affects everybody else. So I think that that is why it is important to have a um, 
the WTO as a multi-trust uh, institution that works well to avoid that kind of situations so that uh, there will be more certainty. The other point that we need to emphasize is that now with climate change, we have extreme events that will create also those uh, issues in which we have volatility of prices. So the combination of climate change and also some geopolitics involving there, it creates even more issues for um, each country. Thank you. Go ahead, Kwa. If, if I can jump in quickly, and I think um, let me put, to take Nigeria as an example on that uh, really good question about protectionism. The last couple of years, uh, Nigeria has seen some of the harmful effects of, of the worst types of protectionism, right, and has has, uh, has has gone in the opposite direction, opening borders for, for food, and we are recently allowing rice rice imports um, in, in part to deal with the um, high food in, inflation. Um, now the question is, um, having done that, you know, what are the steps to now um, to recognize whether, as Valeria said, the comparative advantage lies, and to focus on the policies that would promote that. And I think to do that, one of the things we haven't done yet uh, as much as we should is take some of these analyses of the um, uh, high middle income countries and use those as examples. And so one of the things that uh, James and Shinshan and the team have been helping us to do is to think about, let's say, Indonesia as, as one, just one example for, for Nigeria to consider. Um, and there could be other lots of other countries. I think that would help to really focus in on what, what those next steps are in picking, picking how, to, how, how to proceed beyond just protectionism. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two questions, and I saw this trend, which is looking at the same question from different audience. Uh, we have question here from Enormous and from Mike Anderson. And they are asked, looking at us, the questions around, have you or would the result be different if you considered other factor other than GDP in your analysis um, in the same value chain? So in addition, to, in addition or to the GDP or the economic value, if you looked at something such as environmental impact, loss and gains, et cetera, would the data will be different? Thank you. Um, yes, yes, I, I, I think the conclusions we would, we would reach would be tempered somewhat. I, I think the broader conclusion about long-term transformation and the role of exports and imports and domestic markets, I think that doesn't change. But when we come to looking at what we should be investing in today, there is no doubt that if we take a broader lens and we look not just at growth or even job creation, but we also factor in um, social inclusion, so poverty, um, undernourishment, diet quality, gender inclusion, emissions, risk resilience, we factor in all of these things that we, re that we really do need to take into account when we make investment decisions. Once we factor those in, trade-offs become unavoidable, right? Um, almost impossible to navigate. And I think that is a problem that we have. And, and you know, in each of the country studies, which uh, there is a part, a fifth part that I never spoke about, where we use our models to sort of identify what some of those trade-offs are um, between a handful of different outcomes beyond just GDP, poverty, undernourishment, diets, and jobs, and so on. And without a doubt, a value chain that is really good at driving growth may not necessarily be the ones that are most effective at, um, at improving poverty and so on. So at a value chain level, there are trade-offs that we need to take into account. And I encourage you to look at those studies to see what's the size of some of those trade-offs. The one thing I, I would say um, is that, you know, the broad trade-offs that we are seeing is when we think about inclusion, and I think there was a question that I never talked about, which from an, was it an anthropological point of view, and I cannot speak for anthropologists, but I would imagine that the kinds of things that an anthropologist would worry about are um, things about whether or not we have the control of our own food supply, whether we have um, control over the natural resources in our communities that are being used to produce the food and so on. Those are very real concerns as well, beyond even what I've just said. Um, and I think there are some really careful mm -hmm. things that we need to do to navigate um, those aspects of agri-food system transformation. But the good news is still from an economics perspective, what's good for serving domestic markets is often the foods that many of the households and countries that we're working in are consuming themselves. And I think a strong conclusion from our case studies is those domestic markets are gonna continue to drive growth and transformation in these countries for decades to come. 
And so what is good for domestic markets, and this is not this is a blanket statement, but what is good for domestic markets is often also the same value chains that are good for reducing poverty, creating jobs in local communities, and, uh, and for improving poverty and undernourishment and other things. And so I think we do have a bit of a confluence. There are some difficult trade-offs, but we really see the greatest divergence between more export-oriented crops and those social outcomes. And we see less of a divergence between the more import domestic market targeted value chains and those social outcomes that we're also um, aiming to achieve. And so that's good news. Um, but of course, the devil is in the detail. And when you're designing an investment plan, you're having to pick, pick very particular projects, very particular products. And we need to do, as Kyle was saying, a lot more in-depth analysis of those trade-offs for very particular investment areas. Um, and that's where our work becomes perhaps less, less relevant. The work I've presented now is less relevant for those very practical decisions. Let me stop there. Uh, thank you. One last question. I think we have time for one more co last question from Nir Magadal. And uh, the question around the uh, transformation of agri-food system is, is, uh, and food processing. And as you indicated, food processing or processed product are represent 75% of imported product mm -hmm. and the export is more of the raw agricultural products. And um, the question around should it be, does it mean agri fresh food system transformation means we are consuming more processed food? Uh, uh, as you said, you should not emphasize export oriented production and the same for food processing. And I would like here to highlight that where processing is not, but not all processed food is bad food. Uh, the bulk of processed food is great food. It to conserve the value of the product, reduce food loss and waste, retain the safety, et cetera. There is a subset or a small category of processed food that is the one that has a lot of added sugar. So James, over to you. The point you just made was going to be exactly what I said, that I know from a nutritionist perspective, processing is a very loaded and negative term, but we're not talking about ultra processed foods, many of which are imported, actually. Um, and so worth competing against. But um, but but we're talking about general processing. So we're talking about maize milling. We're talking about um, sort of value added and, and so on. So I think um, so that's a key point to make. That the second is, I mean, I think we have our work cut out for us in trying to decide what investments are most appropriate to drive uh, 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 food processing sectors, vibrant food processing sectors in, in, in low income countries. Um, I think it's going to be a case by case basis. I think we know in general terms what we need. We need reliable energy. We need road infrastructure. We need um, uh, sort of uh, well functioning capital markets and so on. These are all very sized. I think for each value chain, again, and, and for each subsector firm, we need to think specifically about what, what is needed. Um, the one thing I will say, stepping back and thinking more generally, and that I think we're going to have a real challenge for us as an agricultural community, is what everybody always says, which is that, you know, we don't have a ministry for the food system who's sitting there and coordinating across the different line ministries to, to develop coordinated and coherent policies. And so we're going to have to think about how, as we, in these Feed the Future countries, as we promote food system transformation, how are we going to get that coordination? How are we going to build bridges between ministries and get um, more coherent policies? Is it going to be left to people outside of the Ministry of Agriculture to, to deal with that alignment? Or is this something that we're going to have to work on within the Ministries of Agriculture? I think that's an agenda for all of us going forward. And I actually don't know the answer to it, but I know it's going to be something we're going to have to deal with. Thanks, Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, Alejandro, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, everyone uh, that has participated today uh, on uh, this great webinar. Uh, we just wanted to add a quick note uh, to folks connected. Please be aware that USAID is shifting contracts uh, that support AgriLinks over the next couple of months. So during this time, we expect uh, less frequent newsletters and webinars, and there may be slightly slower response time to publish your articles. We want to um, invite you to please continue to contribute to our platform and to participate in our events, even as our cadence of communication may be a little bit slower. Uh, we do expect uh, usual coverage to resume soon. Uh, and thank you all for making AgriLinks a 4,000 plus strong community. 
over to Michael, I think. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to the panelists and presenter for a wonderful presentation. This concludes our webinar. Thank you again.